Hi, Angelo John Lewis uh, for the Sacred Inclusion Network. Um, those of you that are not familiar with us, we're a group of people who consider ourselves spiritual but not religious, and our mission is to help give people tools in that uh, subgroup to um, help change the world. And today it's my enormous privilege to be here in, um, in Sweden to talk to two of the uh, important people of the Archives of the Unexplained, um, short AFU for short. Um, I'm here with um, co-founder Anders Lilligren. Lilligren, thank you. <laughs> He's the co-founder and manager. And uh, I'm also here with um, Klaus Svan. How did I do? Very good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, so these gentlemen are in, involved in a, an enormous um, project um, in, in terms of uh, categorizing um, material related to, I'll call it, unexplained phenomena, with a specific inf interest, perhaps historically, on UFOs. Um, so that's what we're here to talk about. So initially I was thinking I was going to basically um, be interviewing um, um, Klaus, so I'll do the best I can to include everybody here. But one of the things I wanted to start with, um, Klaus, is that um, you, have a, you have a normal job <laughs> for, for perhaps the biggest publication um, newspaper um, in Sweden, um, the New York Times equivalent, and your, uh, your slant is oddities. That's what it says anyway. So I'm just wondering how that emerged. Well, I got a normal job, but I'm not a normal person, <laughs> <laughs> which makes things easier. Uh, when I started my interest in the 1960s, late 1960s, reading, I was uh, maybe 11 or 12 years of age. Uh, and I always wished for hard presents at Christmas, something that I could read, not socks and stuff like that. <laughs> so, well, during the years when I was 16, I started to think that maybe I should contribute in some way to make investigations. So I started my own small UFO society in my hometown of Mariestad. So in 1974, at the age of 16, I I went out meeting the witnesses because I really wanted to know what was behind all of those observations. I had never been a believer, I never been a skeptic. I see myself as a researcher into something that I have no idea really what's behind. But from that day really, in May 1974, I spent hours every day trying to find the answers and of course working with AFU. And uh, my normal day work at Dagens Nyheter, I'm always curious about what lies behind what people say and uh, what's behind the stories. So it really goes hand in hand, I think, my interest in the, the unknown and what I do as a journalist. Anders, um, you're one of the co-founders of this organization. Why don't you give us a very, very brief <laughs> That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have lots of questions I want to ask you, you both. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in, in, in this organization and what you do. Well, I, in the 1960s, there was uh, a huge UFO wave over Scandinavia and uh, more or less whole of Europe. And uh, uh, I started to read uh, clippings, you know. Uh, in the newspaper and uh, got interested. I got hooked. I had a, I had a, a brother who, who died when I was three years old who had left uh, a big uh, box full of uh, literature and models. Uh, he, his inter big interest was aeroplanes and I inherited that. So I, I was stuck on everything that moved in the air and uh, it was very close to, to reading about flying saucers. So that's where I got stuck on the subject. So explain a little bit about uh, this organization, Archives for the Unexplained, AFU. Well, we started out in uh, 1973. We were three guys uh, living in two different towns. And uh, we... Um, uh, decided to to uh, start a, a UFO uh, 
library sort of so to where we could um, uh, yeah, we, we had a donation of about 500 UFO books from uh, Stockholm ufologist and that we placed in a in a lending library and at that time we had very uh, uh, good terms for for sending uh, books across Sweden so we could borrow uh, send books lending them to to people in the south and in the north and uh, so that's how we started really and uh, it, it really developed in the 1980s to become sort of an archive for uh, everything that you know, correspondence and magazines and and, uh, and um, such things. So to give our listeners uh, some idea, um, it, it, grew, it grew up as a very small thing, and now there are how many volumes and how many, and how oh. much, just, you know. You know, we have, uh, uh, if you measure our shelves, we have about four kilometers of shelves. That's our uh, capacity. Not of all of this is full filled, but... Uh, Usually, uh, it, it comes to situations where, where it's almost full, and we have to rent another facility. So now we have about 15 facilities, uh, all placed in, uh, within the same uh, uh, local area in Norrköping, Sweden. So uh, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say this is the largest repository of uh, material uh, around unexplained phenomena probably in, in the entire world that these, these gentlemen are um, categorizing and organizing. Well, well at least it, it's the largest focusing where the focus is on uh, UFO. Yeah. UFOs. Hmm. So, um, <clears throat> so Speaking, speaking about UFOs, um, you both characterize yourself as not believers, but um, sort of um, uh, investigators. So I want, I wanted to know, I want to know a little bit more about that. Have you all, have you, either have you actually seen a UFO? Do you believe the phenomenon is a real phenomenon? Where are you with this? Well, um, I started out as an amateur astronomer, and I'm still uh, often out watching the skies, um, but I've never been out looking for UFOs. And uh, my first and really only important observation of something that I couldn't really understand happened in 1995, on November the 5th. So it, it was quite... <laughs> you remember the date, so it's important. <laughs> Absolutely, it was important. And I could give you a brief summary if you want to. Sure. Because me and my wife were traveling in a car. It was around after midnight, uh, half past midnight. We were traveling from a birthday party outside Stockholm. I, I was driving, and my wife was sitting beside me. And when we came into uh, our small society outside Stockholm, uh, two guys were standing at the, bus, at the bus stop. One was pointing up in the sky like this. The other one was looking. So I said to Anneli, can you take a look and see if you can see what they're looking at? So she leaned forward and tried to see, but she said, I only see stars and it's a wonderful night, which we knew it was, was a perfect night. So we, we passed them. I only had a couple of hundred meters left to drive. So when we parked our car at our driveway, we went out and I thought, now nah, we'll be able to see what they were looking at and I would probably be able to identify it. But we saw nothing. We were standing a couple of meters uh, beside each other. But after a minute, maybe two, out of the sky, not from the horizon, but straight up uh, above us, came three illuminated plus signs flying side by side. And uh, my first thought was this was some birds illuminated by the streetlights. But I could soon see that nothing like that. They were like cut out from a box or whatever. No wing flaps, nothing. They just floated over us quite fast. So I, I shouted to Anneli and she saw it. I ran around the corner of my, our house and they were still flying over our neighbor's house and flew on. And of course at that time I was chairman of UFO Sweden. I'm vice chairman today. But I, would, I did it by the book really. We went inside, we never talked to each other. They said not, not a word. I said to Anneli, okay, here is a form. 
fill that out and I fill my form out and we made drawings and, and then we compared. And I put an investigator into this as well and uh, we never found an explanation to those illuminated crosses. It was very strange. So Anders, uh, you're involved in this enormous enterprise. What, what, do you have a seminal experience of your own? Well, not really. Uh, you know, I'm uh, really the more theoretical guy. Uh, I, uh, I have always been close sighted, you know, I have myopia. Mm. And, and uh, uh, so my ability to watch the sky is <laughs> very much hampered. <laughs> so I, uh, I prefer things that are close to me. <laughs> so. So I, I went, read this really interesting um, uh, blog by a, a colleague of yours. I don't know if I can pronounce his name right. Haken Blumsvist. Oh, that's uh, yeah. quite... Uh, Blumquist, we should say. <laughs> yeah, say again? Blumquist. Blumquist. <laughs> and I'm just going to quote what he said. This is an introductory essay to Esoteric UFOlogy Theme. The history of UFO UFOlogy should be placed in an, within an esoteric context. Throughout history, there have been a tradition of higher knowledge and the claim that it was accessible to us. If only we agreed to be tested to work through certain spiritual problems. That is the meaning of the Hermetic schools. The UFO problem, the question of parapsychology, are central to this business. Looking for a solution isn't just a scientific project, it's a quest, an initiation, an enigma like that of the Sphinx. Actually, that is a, a quote from uh, Jacques Vallée. Mm -hmm. Um, which is interesting because I'm wondering, there's all these people that say, oh, this is just interesting, you know, this, these different kinds of things. This particular person, maybe Jacques Bally, is trying to put it into a, sort of a context mm. as to how we should look at UFO um, uh, behavior. So you've come in contact with probably thousands of people and individuals and collections that are interested in this subject. Uh, how would you characterize um, interest in UFOs and kind of what it all means? I think it's impossible to categorize UFOs into just one, one thing, I mean, just one theme. Uh, for many people, this is a spiritual thing. They, they seek answers, they seek knowledge. Uh, to me, it's more like a physical thing, like um, you can measure them, you can see them on radar. It's something very much real. It is. Uh, but UFOs are so many things. And of course, the, the, the the common denominator are the human beings who, who sees them, who interprets what they are seeing, who discuss this, who thinks uh, they, they, they really manage to uh, find their own answers into a, in an enigma that at this time doesn't have any, any real answers. What's your, what's your answer to my question? Well, it's, uh, you know, every person must have his own answer to, to, to what the UFOs are. And, uh, you know, we, we have visitors here who are rather far out, <laughs> <laughs> in my view. <laughs> but then there are people who are down to earth, and, and we, we try to encompass every... every Every one of them, you know. So you're not going to tell me where you stand on it. You're just noticing all this. Uh, well, I'm quite neutral. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important to say that we are, we are not uh, the ones who judge people. We are not judging the material here. We are making it available, and we are saving the most far out stuff, as Anders calls it, to the most scientific, mm, mm. to show the the, the, the whole uh, spectrum of this. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about uh, government uh, involvement in this phenomenon. Uh, as you um, know, because you've blogged about it, the U.S. government, um, I don't remember what branch, but they, they, they released a bunch of UFO material, to, uh, most of it was redacted. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that they're not the only government that, that's been involved with these kind of things. How would you c categorize um, sort of government involvement, uh, especially in the U UFO phenomenon, and interest in, in, in what's known and what's not known? I mean, if you take a look at Sweden, uh, a couple of years ago, we, we asked the, the Swedish uh, military if they could help us to scan their files, and they did. So they put the person for three and a half months scanning nearly one terabyte of data. And uh, nothing of that is redacted or, or taken away. You mm. can read the names of the witnesses and everything. 
And when it comes to the Swedish military, they have always been very, very forward to us when it comes to help us with answers and files. Um, that is not the case in, a, in every country, of course. If you go to NATO countries, it's a different thing, because most of the time they, they usually treat UFOs as something uh, hostile or maybe mm -hmm. some foreign adversary and they put it in the same category as uh, intrusions of Russian jet fighters, I should say. So uh, it depends on, on how you look at on those observations. The, U, the, the Swedish military doesn't anymore investigate anything when it comes to UFOs. They, they forward observations to us, to UFO Sweden. But, um, and they, I think they see UFOs as a clutter that can, can make things more problematic if there is a, uh, it's a war coming to Sweden as well, mm. which of course is, is a possibility nowadays, which it wasn't just a couple of months ago. So that explains, I think, why they don't want to, 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 to make everything available. And of course the US government are even more cautious and they don't want to show their adversaries what they know and how they are able to measure and, and, uh, and report what they are seeing. Because every little bit and piece could, could be giving away what they are able to see and what kind of, 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 of uh, prestanda they have on their, on their equipment. Yeah, and the Russian government, I imagine, the same. Absolutely. Yeah. And the Chinese. and. And most of those, of course, are very reluctant to, to divulge what they know about unknown adversaries. So you also uh, investigated uh, uh, contactee um, type of activities. Is, is your, your sense is some of these people are credible or what, what, what's your general? Well, they're credible in that respect that they are not uh, fooling us. They believe it themselves. There are, of course, hoaxers and, and the people who really want to make money out from it, or, or uh, just want to get famous. But uh, I met so many persons who have seen entities and maybe been taken aboard their crafts that I'm sure that they have been experiencing something. But in my view, many of those uh, explanations are to be found within the human psyche or, or what we don't today know about the human brain. We are very complex. We don't know everything about how, how humans really work. But of course this is connected to the UFO uh, phenomena, which is very broad, as we said before. It's a part of it, and we cannot just say that this is not reliable. We must listen to it and try to see if we can get anything, any, 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 any aspect from it that can help us to understand the whole complex. Now, when I was talking to a, a friend of mine, um, whom you might have met at the conference that we were both at, uh, attending, um, he was talking about a, a specific, uh, uh, this is something we both can speak to, uh, a, a specific, um, I'll call it Sw Swedish um, strain of influence that to some extent um, corresponds to what um, uh, Valet was talking about. In other words, like in Europe, um, Theosophy is much more of a thing than it is in America. Mm -hmm. People like Annie Besant and uh, Madame Blavatsky and this, that, and the other thing. And this person was attempting to make a connection between uh, the, the UFO studies and um, these sort of, uh, I'll call it esoteric um, traditions. Um, can you speak to that? Is, that, is there something, something there that's distinctly Swedish that would not necessarily be true in, uh, let's say, the American UFO community? Hmm, distinctly Swedish. Really short. Not, not really. I would think you know, it's it's a um, maybe an international phenomenon. Uh, you know, there there's always been a fraction of of ufologists interested in the esoteric aspects. As I showed you, we have, for instance, the Borderland Sciences Research uh, uh, Associates Archive, where. They started in 1945, and the first flying saucers appeared in 47, and they were hard at it from the start, you know, uh, and they uh, they were really famous for their for their esoteric uh, 
interpretation of UFO phenomena. And uh, that was translated into Swedish at an early stage, I think. So maybe we mm. were a bit uh, more conscious about it than many other countries, for instance, in Europe. But um, I really don't, I think it's uh, an international phenomenon, really, the, the esoteric. You know, we have a bookshop here and we, we sell those uh, books uh, to every country on the, on the globe, you know, when, whenever we get copies. You can see that the uh, people who are interested in UFOs are also often interested in Atlantis, uh, the Bermuda yeah. Triangle, spiritual healings, uh, everything unknown. So I'm not surprised that it's, it's still like that, even though the theosophical interpretations are not, uh, not that common today in Sweden, I should say. It's something that lies behind us in, in many respects, mm -hmm. but believes in, in uh, the unusual and uh, an openness to unexplained phenomenon. So you were talking about the, the, the Swedish government's uh, openness in terms of sharing information um, to you, which um, is quite interesting in and of itself. Uh, but it also seems that, um, or not, in addition to that, it seems that we as human beings are, are interested, that's what we do, we're trying, to, we're trying to figure out what the unknown is and make it known or something. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is um, there's this whole material about UFOs in particular that is considered strange to some people. How do you see the importance of, of this in terms of uh, people understanding this particular phenomenon, and for that matter, other unknown phenomena? Where, where are we now, and uh, where, where are we going with that, with all this? I mean, we, we haven't traveled that far, really, since I started. I mean, what I know today, I knew mostly when I started in 1974, except that I'm now much better equipped to, to find the explanations to many of the observations that I, I found quite unexplainable at that time. Uh, there, there are really two ways to, to look upon this. I mean, the one way is the, the military way to look upon it, like physical crafts that could be a problem for, for your country. Well, the other way, of course, is like Tom DeLonge and people like that that look upon this as the, the gods are returning, that uh, the gods of the ancients are still here and they are traveling in some sort of flying saucer-like crafts. That you can find today as well, and Tom DeLonge has, of course, made this line of thinking popular again. Uh, it's very hard to say, it's very hard to, ex to, to investigate the spiritual side of the, this phenomenon. Uh, it, turns, it boils down to people's stories. Mm. When it comes to the more military aspects, you can also find pictures and radar in yeah. terms more tangible it's more tangible yeah. absolutely and I think maybe those two lines merge somewhere they are connected of course in some ways but if they are really if they are really the, the very same thing we don't know because uh, you, you, meetings with gods and, and uh, entities of, of other worlds have been around for hundreds and hundreds yeah. of years it's just recently we have connected them to visitors from outer space And, and UFOs is a powerful sociological fact, you know, you, you cannot see, see uh, uh, sort it away. It's always there in the media and uh, so... Uh, hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's when, when I had a conversation with Whit Whitney, Whitney Stryver, whom you're, you're aware of, you have like a whole um, wing or whatever, yeah. I, I saw some of his material and um, one of the things, uh, those of you who don't know, he's the um, the author of the book Communion. He used to be a horror writer, and uh, he had a contactee experience, which was made into a movie called Communion. I think 1986, something like that. After but, that, yeah. After was it after that? Yeah. But, but in any event, when the movie came out, um, he got letters from all over the world, which sort of shows the universal interest in mm -hmm. this field, no matter what. Um, the academy or anybody thinks like that. It's, it's just it's just around. So that, that there, there's, there's there, therefore there is something there that is um, sort of endemic to human inquiry to some extent. And you you in this place you collect um, interest from all over the world. People are sending you hmm. you things. So um, 
Yeah, this is a universal project in, on some certain level. Absolutely. I spent some time looking through some of the letters uh, at the Rice University. Yes. Because I, I met with this Reber in 1988 the first time, and now I met him again, so it was very nice to catch up with him. And uh, he got tens of, th tens of thousands of letters from people all around the world telling about meetings with aliens because he was asking for that. Yes. He never got the, the angels or whatever, trolls or, or right. stuff, you know. So, I mean, what you're asking for, you will probably get. Yes, that's true. So he got them. He got the entities that looked like uh, the ones he met, in, in, many, in many ways at least. But you, you would think that people are not believers in... in uh, in, uh, in in trolls and gnomes and things like that anymore, but we still meet them. You know, I'm I'm interviewing people today that are seeing those kinds of entities with small hats and you know long beards and whatever you would like them to have. And of course, angels. One of my best friends in my hometown, she writes books about meetings with angels. Seven books now, and the reports are pouring in from people who interacts with angels. And I think you can find anything and everything you want if you really look for it, because we people are complex. That's for sure. So let, let's con conclude this by talking about, about AFU, uh, what, you, what you hope to accomplish, and um, maybe a plea for funding. Whatever, wh wh where are you going with this organization, and uh, you know, how can uh, anyone who listens to this help? I can start and others can fill in. I mean, we are going <laughs> upwards all the time, I should say. It's coming so many donations to us, not money-wise, but books, papers, files, pictures. And our aim is to, to save the heritage, really, from the researchers. They have spent a lifetime assembling all of this. We want to put everything in one place and make it available to researchers for the future. But we are relying on about 50 people, 50 donators. Nearly all of them are from Sweden. We would like that to be an international thing. We would love to have more foreign donators and, and contributors to AFU so we can still keep this fantastic enterprise up and keep uh, people informed, put more things online, make more things available on our download page and uh, be, a, be a, a, big, a big player in this, really. You are a big player in it already, but yes, more, more, more of it so. Anders, what, what would you like to say? Well, uh, uh, UFOs is, uh, uh, you could compare it to folklore, like the, the folkloric traditions. Uh, people in, uh, so researchers in Sweden traveled the countryside 100 years ago collecting stories for, about trolls and, and, uh, and uh, such things, you know, uh, old traditions. And uh, we are essentially doing the same. Mm. We are. And we are not interpreting everything here. We are just helping to build a foundation for future research. If it is fairies, visions of Virgin Mary, aliens, or sea monsters. We, 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 we have developed a sort of a sorting table for all these uh, things, you know, where, that we use, at least for the books, we have about 750 uh, subject headings where we sort books, like where Roswell case, for instance, is one one particular hmm. shelf, and then there are seven hundred and forty nine others. And that shows it's a very complex thing we are dealing with, and it's so many uh, branches on this tree. So, if you want to know more about the archives for the unexplained, uh, go to their website. It's um, um, www.afu.se. And there's lots of interesting things there, books that you can buy. Um, there's also a web shop that they have, which I'm sure there's a link to that. We sell in US dollars, you know, to all over the world. Australia and uh, China and uh, Japan and, wow. and, and all yeah. corners of the globe. 
Uh, so that's some of our income, you know. Mm. Uh, and uh, we also have here the Swedish Report Archive. Uh, that's the first five shelves with the white folders here. Um, it includes about 20,000 Swedish UFO reports from uh, the beginning up to to about uh, the early 20s maybe. Then uh, UFO Sweden, who is one of the providers of material for this, you know, we, we integrate UFO Sweden's report investigations with uh, investigations from the uh, defense authorities and uh, from press stories, you know, so that we make uh, uh, um, a folder of each case, you know, uh, and it's all arranged by date. So you can, um, if you have a date when you've seen something, we can check it mm. up. Then we have on that uh, wall the Danish report archive, which we have been working with uh, for a few years now, and we're also working on establishing a Norwegian. A, a UFO report archive. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we are still working on this. We are right now expecting, for instance, 18 big boxes of material from Norway to complete what we have, you know. So it's um, an ongoing project. It, that's impressive. It's yeah. really impressive. Yeah, right. Because it's running all the time, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Eight hours a day, and uh, he always has uh, uh, some project going on. Right now, he's working on on the uh, 14 times files. Yes. You know, we are getting uh, files from the editorial office of 14 times in London, mm. and uh, we process this by scanning uh, incoming materials, like clippings and and their correspondences. It's really huge. <coughs> the 14 Times collection is really, is really huge. Yeah. And it's been uh, placed in, in a basement in London for, for many years. years yeah. And there's still lots of it left there. Oh. And hopefully we will go it's there really this you year. You people that are digitalizing it. Yeah, I mean, we are doing that. They couldn't do it yeah. for themselves. We, so far, we have done more than one million, wow. one, half, a, half a million uh, pages. Newspaper clippings. On newspaper on. clippings, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, uh, but it's continuing. He, he uh, whenever there is nothing else important, he, he, he goes on. back to this collection, you but, know. But you will see the backlog when we are come, come into another facility where there are huge amounts of things that are not I'm, I'm so focused on this. This, this <laughs> is been in continuous use for, I mean, I just threw away an old uh, HP printer. I was, I was I hated it to see it go. <laughs> this yeah. is still it's still it's still working. Yeah, yeah. He has a, you know we bought to change parts. We bought no, we no. Bought, nothing. We bought five of these. You know we right. had a, a government program a couple of years yeah. ago. You know essentially we had three people uh, cost us nothing and we actually got paid. You know like four or five thousand Swedish krona each month for each person wow. we had. And at that time, we had 12 people here. Uh, five or six were here working on, on uh, uh, scanners, you mm -hmm. know. And then we had uh, a handful of people who were working on tape recorders, you know. Mm -hmm. So we have managed to, to um, digitize about 5,000 of those uh, compact cassettes, mm -hmm. you know, right. C60. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, almost a thousand uh, roll to roll tapes, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. old type. Mm -hmm. So um, we had guys in every corner. <laughs> yeah. And one of the most impressive uh, scanning projects we have, have done is really the Bufora files, I think, British UFO yeah. Research Association, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, their files were scattered all around Britain. Mm. And it took me. 10 or 15 years to, to assemble most of them. And then here, <coughs> it was all scanned and digitized. The reel-to-reel the -reel tapes, the cassette tapes, the pictures, the magazines, 
the UFO investigations. Yeah. And when Bufora turned 50, we could give them everything back on a hard drive, right, right. which they never would right. have been able to do right. by themselves. But we did it mm -hmm. here. And that is really amazing and impressive. We, we even digitized their, uh, you know, their recordings. They had a meeting every month wow. at, uh, uh, at the Kensington Library in mm. London where they uh, uh, invited uh, a, a contemporary author, you know, who has written some books or had some knowledge, you know, to have uh, present a lecture. And those were recorded, you know, and we recorded all of that stuff, uh, digitized it. I mean, it's unique. There's only one of those tapes and we, we got it. Mm. And uh, I think that, that tells really what AFU is about. Yes. Not just to preserve, but to, to save right. those from, from vanishing from, from, from Earth, really. Because they had been thrown away in, yeah. in the end. And the guy who kept those reel-to-reel -reel tapes, he was the head of Euphora for many years, but then he, he dropped out. And you're basically uh, talking about a, 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 a collection of, or, of, of, in other words, these are, these are just groups of people. Yeah. They're not necessarily funded by anybody. This is like people that are just interested in the subject. Absolutely. And of course, they have meetings and all these kinds of things like that. It's a that. hobby. I mean, that is yes, a, yes, and you have a repository for all this kind of material, and yeah. someone, Kripals, and all these sort of people who can mm. make sense of it at some point. Because hopefully. even if you call yourself an association or organization, most yeah. of those are not. Yeah, they're just they are a group of enthusiasts. Group basically. enthusiasts, mm. yeah. and their files are always scattered around. Yes, yes. So I mean, keeping them in one place, as we really would love to do and do. Yeah, that is hugely important for us. Mm. And collection from 20 years back. Uh, now it's been being completed by a lot of editions from, from uh, Norwegian researchers. You know. And those are coming from different places in Norway as well. I mean, uh, we, we had uh, one of the contactees in Norway, Knut Åsheim, when he passed away, they accidentally, the family accidentally found a letter from me at the top. Oh, really? Of, of a huge pile of paper, and they were they had no idea what to do about it, and they found this and they contacted me, just by chance. Right, right. And uh, I went there uh, from Stockholm to outside Oslo over the night, filled the car, ah. and went back and, and uh, saved it all. And uh, much of what we are now scanning comes from Knut Olsen. It would have been lost forever. Mm. If just this letter had to be found. So, we are lucky sometimes. Nu har det här uppe i hamnen något nu. Ja, vi får se var det hamnar till slut. Ja, det är mycket där här ute. Kanske gå igenom taket sen. Ja, precis. Det kan du göra. Tjeninga jobbar till. Some dollars maybe, something like that, to buy them. And have them out with you. They are usually important to us because we were really running out of not maybe space or space as well, but to keep things orderly. Mm. Ah. Yeah. I'm trying to sort everything here by uh, name, you know, so that we can find things. This is this Anders. This is from the, the Fortune Times as well. Mm -hmm. But those are well, we have plenty of that I'm as sure. well, yeah. <laughs> because from the, the basement where those are coming from, uh, yeah. they collect a couple of liters of water yeah, yeah. every every day. Yeah, in that and it's. To smell that you, can, yeah. you wouldn't love to be. <laughs> no. We are spending hours and hours there when we are in London every year. Really? Yeah. yeah. Probably will shorten my life for mm. ten years. Or so. <laughs> How do you manage to, uh, you know, when, when a document gets wet like that? What, what can you do? You obviously, you have to dry it out. Yeah. Some are not. Some are not retrievable. No, it isn't. But we, we try to save as much as we can, of course. Uh, this is part yeah. of the, you know, we have the, uh, the Borderland yeah. Sciences Research Association in California. This is their, their collection uh, and is continuing 
all that stuff. And this took us years and years to get because uh, Håkan, he tried to try to got it, and I tried to get it as well. He never answered emails, not letters, not telephone really? calls. <laughs> but one night at two o'clock, I called him, and he picked up his phone, and that was his yeah. He was done. Oh. And he was sold. He was sold. We he went. Sold. To, <laughs> so we went to Eureka in California and right. packed it all. Wow. So uh, it took us a full day just to, to pack it there in uh, two, two, two pallets. So it's a fantastic collection. It's this so old. This is old. a man here. We lost here. Yeah. And uh, I mean, they're from the 1940s. Some really? of those. Really? Wow. They yeah. were really uh, pioneers of UFO research. Is that in, right? in, in, of private UFO research <laughs> in <laughs> the US. You could mm. think it was uh, Corey Lawrence and an April, but. Yeah. Uh, they were really the first one in 1947 when the first, uh, uh, even in 1946, they wrote about this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the early stages of UFO history. Yeah, so it's hugely important to have it done. This is just a part of it, of course, mm -hmm. and there is the rest. Mm -hmm. Is this? Yes, yes, he, he had a radio show. Radio show. Yeah, mm -hmm. lighting there. And he interviewed, this is the only one left, I mean, there's yeah. no copies. Right. And we got those from the United States, say, 10 years ago, something like that. And we have digitized them all. Mm. Some of them were just falling to pieces when we opened, opened yeah. them. Yeah, wow. But the, the, yeah. those are in good conditions. But not everyone was. But every single important contactee from the US was interviewed by Nightingale. Nightingale and John Otto and other people. And we got those from the John Otto estate. Mm -hmm. And here we can also see the blue book files. The US Air Force UFO project. Mm -hmm. And this is from, well, we got them for maybe 15 or 20 years ago. So those are of the microfilms with uh, the complete blue book file. Mm. Yeah, one of the things I'm going to ask you all is a sort of a government on. Uh, different governments have different um well projects and yeah projects and uh yeah you and andrews are in a position to know a little bit about that yeah so. so this is good for us to have yeah and there are another row behind mm -hmm. this <laughs> so there are lots oh, of it's just a double doubled up yeah Emptying this, moving to to the uh, to the new facility. Yeah. New facility, but uh, there is always, uh, you know, uh, like our magazine store is pretty much full, mm. so we need more space here. It was before the pandemic, mm. slightly before, so it's maybe three years ago now, and. Uh, he was interested in our uh, Japanese oh. magazines, you know, and we, uh, he, he spent, uh, you know, with, with he spent three days here, this, this shelf, uh, and uh, we also sorted out double surplus in issues for him, so we brought a package of, of uh, Japanese magazines, all from the 1960s and so, back to on his plane. He was very happy. He was, <laughs> sure. yeah. Oh, well, we, we have some from India, some from China. Yeah. Sri Lanka. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, really. But of course, Asia is not what we have the most from, it's mostly from the English speaking world. But in, in, this is a broad question, but, um, you know, Chinese government, Chinese people, are they interested in this subject also? These subjects also? Yes, they are. They, they used to have quite a few uh, UFO groups in China. Mm. I'm not sure how much activity there is right now, but uh, during the last 10 years, the government, government been quite involved. Uh, they are allowed to do that, but uh, you don't hear much from China, really. Uh, yeah, China, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there, may there, there was a, a Chinese journal uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was. We have a, f a couple of volumes of this, and it was uh, 
uh, they claim to have 300,000 subscribers. Wow. That's, uh, That's quite good. That yeah. beats Mewful and, <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and everything. But so. I mean, a country like India, yeah. no UFO groups, no, no magazines. Nothing. I mean, it's a huge country. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> very, very. I mean, this, this cover is so. I mean, this is. Everyone has seen it. Right, right. It's a classic. <laughs> they still exist? Fate magazine? They start publishing? They did a couple of years ago. Fate? They are still around? Uh, I am. Um, I, I really don't know. We had mm. a subscription, but it ended some way, and mm. you know, it, it's got thinner and thinner. Mm, mm, uh, maybe mm, a, mm, a couple of Quart issues monthly, each and year. Quarterly, and, and then uh, so I really don't know yeah. about the, the condition now. Well, I'm not sure really I think we had another copy of the number one issue. Helped us to find those those uh, files from other places around Canada, and he assembled it and, and uh, sent it to us. Took a year to get it here because it was quite problematic with shipping and uh, well, mm. he had to travel and get things for us and store it and then send it. And mm. I mean, they are older people and they have to carry things to, yeah. by themselves <laughs> and put on pallets. <laughs> right. So it's not that easy. And I probably I will have to go to Ohio later this year to help a guy who will send a huge donation to us. But he's so old that he couldn't do it by himself. So I must go there and help him to pack it. And then you ship it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, I bet you carried a lot of stuff back just from the conference, right? Did you? Did yeah, you? yeah, I feel my valuable. Really I'm valuable. looking forward to has, spending some time with this, but you know, the life is always uh, bombshells. <laughs> <laughs> Not if, even if you don't live in Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> but you are privileged. You have the opportunity to sift through all of those. I, um, I don't have that time because when I'm coming here, it's all still in boxes or it's done. Right. Yeah. yeah. But Anders, he must really look through it. And I also do that, but I have other stuff back at my place that I'm going through, of course. Mm. But no one of us has ever seen he, everything he, here. He has a, a wife growling about <laughs> filling all the, the, uh, the know, floors. <laughs> I have a sofa in my, in my second <laughs> store downstairs that uh, we haven't been able to access for one and a half year. She's a forgiving woman. She's a forgiving. Yeah. She's a very, very good woman. And Creighton, he talked about, uh, speak about ten languages. I mean, like Arabic and, uh, and Russian and Mandarin. Mm, mm. He had contacts all over the world. The world, yeah. When he passed away, I was the first to enter his house, mm. and it was a mess. It was completely mess. And uh, one guy who took care of all of this, he transported it to his garage outside in Rickmansworth, west of London. And uh, I spent uh, ten visits. I visited him ten times during ten years, wow. trying to persuade him to give this to us. And the wow. tenth time, he said, "Okay, take it." <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm tired of hearing from you. So take it. <laughs> he, was, he was crying when we left. He said, "Oh, it's my baby." He was, oh. he was really crying for it. But we got it here, and it took a couple of years for Anders and uh, the staff here to go through it and yeah. to sort it and put yeah. it in those boxes. And take a look here behind me. It's huge. I mean, wow, all this. Oh, mm -hmm. And it's also behind you. Right. Wow. Wow. Good Lord. And this is just one UFO group in, right. in uh, Britain, the Flying Saucer Review. And he had contact, as I said, all over the world. Wow. So it's, it's completely, it's fantastic. You got letters and uh, not only the letters sent to him, but also often copies of his letters sent to them. Collecting from scientific journals, anomalies, strange mysteries mm. and things that science at that time didn't have the answer to. And this also took quite a few years to persuade the family to send to us. Because his wife is still around, she's over 90, she's over 90 year, years of age. And she ordered it before she ordered it, she yes. ordered it before she first gave it. Yeah, to not like this, but right. good enough. Right. <laughs> so this was an easy task for Anders to, to <laughs> put into boxes. And if you see, it goes around here. Wow. It's yeah. quite impressive as well. 
It's really a wonderful collection. So this is from 1608 and it's about visions. This is probably our oldest book we have in our collection. Religious visions? Just religious yeah, religious visions. So we have ancient cultures here, we have psychology and we have religion. So it's pretty much everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, it's easy yeah. to get lost here. Of course, uh, was a good friend of ours. He visited there a few once, and uh, he donated everything connected to his interests a couple of months before he passed away. And you can see to the left of you here, I mean, this is all paranormal or, or psychic magazines, uh, which are very, very hard to find. <laughs> Wonderful stuff really. The medium, 1875. Mm. Wow. It's really fantastic things. It's a real ghost. Wow. Have you seen a real ghost before? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there it is now, half right? <laughs> well. Wow, that's quite a the journal. It's not Jeez. very much illustrated as you see, but sometimes they, they had. But uh, you cannot get those. I'm sure it's yeah. very, very hard to find. When's that from? 1849. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not bad. UFOs and uh, here starts uh, 14, yeah. our 14 collections. And then we have uh, natural sciences, you know, we collect books about the background of geological and meteorological mm -hmm. phenomena and such, astronomy. <laughs> It is also uh, Russian UFO books uh, down the hall. Swiss? Yeah. Good picture, Swiss. Well, it's a little too good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You're right. laughs> we have a very nice collection here of, of his works. And this is, of course, the Wendell Stevens thing we talked yeah. about earlier. Yeah. This yeah. is what it looked like mm -hmm. when he published right. Contact wow. Cases. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Angelo Jones.